Hello, everyone. So welcome to the session for indigenization of accounting courses. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge that Douglas College uh, is located on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people of the Kakait and uh, Kwakwetlam First Nations. Uh, before we start, I'm going to introduce you to Zain. Uh, Zain is our speaker today. Um, I know Zain from SFU. We are uh, we are colleagues at SFU at the Grad uh, BD School. Zain is the accounting professor for the Executive MBA in the Indigenous, Indigenous Business and Leadership Program. Zain has a Bachelor of Science in Applied Accounting and has experience in internal audit, finance, administration, and in various organizations. In 2010, Zain became an affiliate of ACCA and has been a fellow since 2017. He, has, he is also a CPA and holds the designation of Certified Aboriginal Financial Manager from, through AFOA Canada. They moved to Coast Salish Territory, Vancouver in 2011 to pursue higher education and advance his career. He attended SFU between 2011 and 2013 to pursue his MBA. During this time, he also worked as an intern at Kanaka Bar Indian Band and established his own consulting practice that focuses in the areas of governance, strategy and planning, management and capacity building. Since 2013, Zane has worked as, with several indigenous communities and organizations, as well as other institutions that support indigenous people's resiliency. He has held senior leadership and management position in various indigenous organizations and is committed to their causes. So I'm going to now pass the mic to Zane and off we go. Awesome. Thanks for that introduction, um, Arsene. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, it certainly helps me guide through the conversation and um, some people are visual, so it helps people see what I'm talking about. Um, okay. Can everyone see the screen? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, um, great introduction. Um, certainly uh, makes me think all, all, all that I've done. Um, over the years, um, and it's it's certainly been a been a fun ride. But I guess um, I'll I'll just um, start by acknowledging uh, the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people uh, where I uh, work, live, and play. Um, more specifically, um, in, in, on the territories of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Um, it's a it's a pleasure for me to uh, be here today um, in in front of you guys and just um, explain, I guess, what I've done um, in, in, in my life and how I've indigenized um, the courses that I've taught. I mean, just so you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a journey, like I'm still enjoying that journey. I'm still learning a lot. So in no way or shape, I consider myself an expert on any, any of what I'm going to be talking about. The goal, I guess, is to just explain how I've achieved what I've done um, over the years and um, just have an, have an open conversation towards the end. Um, about about how it can be done even better. Normally, I would have liked to um, also uh, thank at this point, I would have thanked um, an elder, but I guess that's not the case in, 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 in this uh, situation. But certainly a key component of this whole idea of indigenization, um, because that's something that, um, that I like to do uh, when I'm teaching a course, to bring someone in from, from, from a local community and kind of um, set the tone of the session, you know, uh, why are we here to, and what are we discussing? So that's the starting point of indigenization as far as I'm concerned. Um, with that, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the, 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 the mental health impacts um, because of all the things that are happening around us. I, I, you, can, you can talk about the pandemic, you can look at what's happened in DC over the last I'd say three, four months, the wildfires and um, the more recent flooding situation. And then we kind of know where the trajectory is headed um, in the coming, coming months. We are looking at colder weather uh, followed by avalanches and all, all the things that happen. We are kind of shelled in our, our, our little bubbles, uh, but certainly uh, communities in, 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 in the rural part of BC, indigenous communities more specifically, are, are facing the brunt of all of that. Um, and, and I work with a few, so I kind of 
get get that sense uh, from ground zero. And I guess that some that is something that keeps me motivated. That is something that makes me passionate about what I do, and um, just wakes me up every morning to help contribute to this whole process of um, uh, reconciliation. You can call it, you can call it indigenization, whatever that looks like to you. But I guess to me, it's about supporting indigenous people get their uh, get their rightful place um, in in this land that we so call. Um, Canada, you know, uh, so that's, I guess, that's where I come from. Um, certainly is a, is a bit of a unique uh, in, in, in trying times that we are living in right now. Um, but I guess just um, who am I, what makes me qualified for, uh, for this conversation today? Um, Arsene gave a bit of a background and I'm grateful for all of that. Uh, but I always doubt myself. And in fact, I doubt myself about this topic because I'm a non-Indigenous person talking about indigenization um, and, and, and just how does that work, you know, one may ask. And I asked that question to us and I, um, and, and I was kind of preparing for this session and um, she told me that because you are a non-Indigenous person, because you've had some experience in uh, Indigenous communities and because you are teaching accounting, you're actually a perfect fit for this conversation. Um, since we are talking with the accounting faculty who is excited to indigenize their courses and uh, majority of them are actually non-indigenous people. So you could certainly come in and share your experiences um, as, as a non-indigenous indigenous person uh, with some relative experience. Um, but like I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, an expert in indigenization, um, nor um, am I a practicing accountant? Um, I, I, I like accounting, I understand it, I get it. Um, but when, I, when, it comes to, uh, com when it comes to actually sharing that knowledge, I'm able to simplify that language and able to relate that knowledge with, uh, with, with, with people uh, in a classroom setting. Um, so that's, that's essentially what, what I've been trying to do over the last few years. And I've learned a lot of things and I still am learning. Um, but if you are really interested in understanding my journey, there's a link uh, right there. Um, feel free to have a look at it and, and you'll get a sense of how I started my career and all that. Uh, but basically, I was born and raised not in Canada. I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, to parents um, who, 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 to, who, who really loved me and my siblings um, who were younger than me. Um, and I grew up in, in, in the Ismaili community and I kind of feel very... Uh, grateful for both my parents and the community I grew up in because that kind of provided me with the, with the early values that were super important uh, for all the work that I do today. And I acknowledge that every time when I go to a class today or, uh, or, or a speaking engagement because that, that is how I'm able to connect with people, with, with, with the audience out there. And um, it certainly is appreciated at the other end, particularly with indigenous communities when, or people when, when I'm working with, because there's that similar kind of values that exist um, there. So that's where I grew up. Um, it, it was in Pakistan where I received all my early education, um, which kind of led me to uh, an undergrad degree and uh, in, in, in an accounting designation, ACCA, which I noticed some of you also have. Um, so it's, it's good to meet uh, fellow ACCAs in, in, in Canada. Um, but in 2010, I kind of decided to, to pursue higher education. Um, and that's where, where it all kind of led me to SFU, um, the BD School of Business, where I pursued my MBA. At the same time, as I also decided to convert my ACCA into CGA back when there was no CPA. Um, so um, I kind of uh, became a CPA later on over, over time. But as, a, um, as, as part of my education, as part of my MBA, I had to um, do an internship. And I was really passionate about this whole idea of working in the social sector, social side of things. Um, and I started just learning about, um, uh, I guess I was in, on a bus when I started reading about um, I Don't Know More at the time. And it, it, something about that movement really sparked an interest in me, and I just couldn't um, couldn't understand what was happening because I had just moved from a country, from a third world country, to a developed country, and I all of a sudden realized that well, there is there is something wrong here. There's something that's that's not right, and I it, it certainly intrigued me, um, and and I started exploring that um, that that space. Uh, by getting involved with Krakatun or Kanaka Bar, 
um, as an intern. Um, and initially, it was supposed to be a four-month internship that got into an eight-month internship that has since become a bit of a lifetime um, uh, relationship, if, if, if you ask me. So I guess that's how I first got involved um, in this whole indigenous space. And um, as I was working, um, I kind of realized that there's this tremendous need in the space. Um, there's huge shortage of people, um, qualified people for whatever reason or for whatever reluctance um, just doesn't exist. People aren't um, there to, to help communities because everyone's going after the next big thing and that's fine, but um, there's all that work that needs to still be done in, in the indigenous space and there's that wide gap that exists uh, from a socioeconomic perspective. So how do you fill that gap? And that's where I decided to uh, establish my, my own practice, um, Zedin Advisory, which kind of focuses on four things, um, governance, strategy and planning, management support and capacity building. So how can you run a community organization? And how do we teach all that to people in the community so that we are kind of taking ourselves out of the equation? And that's something that I've been practicing for a while now. Um, but also on the side, I've been uh, coming back to the education institution that I myself studied at, at SFU, to share everything that I'm learning through my professional engagements. And um, for the last, I'd say, three and a half times, I've been teaching this course um, called Accounting for Decision Making. And it was changed to um, Financial and Managerial Accounting for Indigenous Leaders. Um, and I, that's what it's called now, but I've taught that course three and a half times. I say that because initially it was just a two credit course and then it became a full four credit course. Um, and, and every time I've learned something new, um, I, I, I wanna keep doing that um, going forward and continue on that journey. Um, and in, in, in that pursuit of learning more, I more recently became um, a, a CAFM that was like last week or the week before when I got my designation from AFOE Canada. So I kind of feel very, very grateful for all um, that I just have in terms of my professional experiences, my education, um, the relevant practical um, in, in life experiences. And um, what I want to do is just share it, share it with um, communities that I work with, share it with um, students in a classroom setting, share it with um, accounting faculty at Douglas today. So uh, that's, I guess, why I'm, I'm here. I um, mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an honor. It's a, it's a great feeling to uh, just share all this knowledge. But I guess uh, what I have learned over time, I'm not, I'm not going to read all this, um, all, all that's on the slide. You can, you'll get a copy of this presentation, I suppose. Um, but I guess I'll be sharing with you only what I know. Um, like I said, I too come from a colonized country and that's where um, working with indigenous people, it certainly opened my own eyes where I started seeing things differently and um, kind of realized that there is still so many, so many traces of colonization in my own, uh, my own family, in my own community. And um, had I not worked uh, with, with, with indigenous people, I may have not realized that. So, um, there's, there's a lot there to kind of unlearn, a lot of learnings that I, I, I would like to unlearn, uh, whether my, my family, my, my community does it or not, that's not my business, but I certainly have realized that there is a lot of unlearning to do. Um, and I'm, I'm working on that as, as we go and trying to remain healthy uh, from a holistic perspective. Um, the, the values that you're seeing on the screen, I guess um, these are things that I've learned um, in my life, um, in, in, my, in my practice um, on the ground. And um, also while I'm teaching, you know, um, it's all really helped me greatly um, when I'm teaching um, and sharing all this knowledge and has allowed me to make um, little impacts here and there um, as and when I can. So I guess that's, those are, those are just my learnings and you'll see these being applied throughout uh, the presentation, throughout the a course that I just recently uh, delivered and what I will be talking in greater detail here shortly. But I guess um, a little bit about you guys. Um, you already kind of know who you are. I did not, so I did some research on you, just looked up your uh, your profiles on, on, on Douglas's website and uh, be 
very honest and me, um, I kind of felt a little intimidated when I was coming here. Again, just looking at your qualifications and your experiences. So there's a collective wealth of knowledge that exists right now in this room. And, and that's a lot of power. That's a lot of uh, value that you can provide to this whole process of indigenization. And uh, whether it's at Douglas elsewhere um, or, um, or, or, or towards this whole idea of reconciliation um, at, in, at a national um, and provincial uh, level. So um, kudos to you guys for, for being here. Um, I guess one thing that you want to get out of this session is um, indigenization of accounting courses, right? And that's, um, that's something that we want to talk about. So um, let's, let's get into that, um, I guess. Um, the objective for the day, um, just breaking it down into four, uh, four sub goals, you may. Um, that's going to be the flow of this uh, conversation right now. And um, before we get into this whole idea of what, how, um, I, I like to start my sessions just by talking about the why, because it really set, um, sets the foundation. Um, if you know that things become easy later on. So um, we'll talk a little bit about why indigenization is needed. Then um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the research that already exists. Because like I said, I'm still a learner. I'm still learning about this whole idea of indigenization. I agree with it, uh, but I don't know it all. Um, so there's a lot of good research out there. Uh, that we can we can all access and apply to our courses and I have, uh, which will be the third piece of the puzzle today where I'll just walk you through the course that I just did and um, how I did it. And um, so we can certainly have uh, discussions about that, all of that, any of that um, towards, towards the end where uh, we can also talk about what, what else could be done potentially to make our uh, courses more indigenized um, in our individual capacities. So I guess that's the plan for, uh, for, for, for the day. And we'll do all the questions uh, towards the end um, of the session because I just find that uh, is, is a bit more efficient way of doing it um, than just asking questions throughout the, uh, throughout the session. So um, with that, well, let's, I guess, look at um, why indigenization is really needed. Um, again, not going to read all of all, 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 all the text here. You'll you'll get a copy of it, and where you're seeing the links, you're welcome to kind of go and steal it, um, however you see fit. Uh, but essentially, we all can agree. We all um, kind of know that there is that need that already exists, um, and it's important to create that win-win by creating that connection um, with the connection of our accounting mindsets. With, um, with, with what's happening in indigenous First Nations communities, you know? Um, and that's something that needs to be done. Uh, we all can agree to that because by doing so, us as faculty um, and our students can greatly benefit. Um, our minds can be more open to a new ways of doing things. Um, it can certainly help us enhance our understanding of, 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 of this world that we, we are living in and kind of help us figure out our place in that, in that world, because um, often I find myself uh, lost. And uh, when I do so, I mean, there's ways to, to reconnect, um, but I, I, I have those conversations with uh, people in communities and just um, understand from a spiritual perspective, where, where, where do I need to be, you know? Um, and all of that matters to me. Um, if, if it does to you, then you need to practice that um, at your own end as well. But indigenization also, could help with this overall reconciliation process um, uh, that's happening in Canada um, and, and create a bit of a just system um, that still to this day, I don't think really exists, um, but it needs to be worked on. Um, and and with, with conversations like today's, I think it certainly could move towards uh, that. And um, in doing so, it can certainly reverse the whole um, adverse impacts of colonization, you know, um, it, it can change that, it can overcome the deficiencies that colonization created in, in people, um, resources, money, um, technology in many, many communities. And lastly, I guess it can, it can help you as uh, teachers, as, as practitioners, differentiate yourselves um, from, from others in, in this whole competitive marketplace that we all kind of uh, live in. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is a strong 
case, a strong business case for all of this. Um, but you may still ask, I guess, why do we need it? Um, you know, and it's a it's a it's a very legit question. Um, and by answering uh, it in the way I've answered in, on on the screen, you can actually visualize that. Um, you know, history is a is a great teacher. It has taught me a lot of things. Um, and that's that the answer is right there. You know, since time immemorial, um, there's been people uh, who've lived on this land in a, in a very uh, in a very sustainable way. But um, I guess after the thing called doctrine of discovery, things started changing where uh, the process of colonization began. Um, and as colonization commenced, there's many things that happened, you know, um, there's some were good, but most were really bizarre and bad things happened to indigenous people. You know, that's what history, uh, history kind of tells us. Um, and, um, and I wouldn't discount the, the early times of, um, of colonization when trade was kind of peaceful, but then after a certain period of time, I mean, a greed kicks in, you know, uh, this whole idea of nationhood kicks in and um, the, this, the, the, the process of industrialization, globalization, urbanization that still to this day continues um, has taken away lands and resources of, uh, of, of indigenous people. And um, that's, a, that's a fact that we can't really do anything about, can't change. But I think uh, we can use that information to, to alter, um, alter our present state um, and, and, and work towards a better uh, future, a more just future. So I guess um, history certainly teaches a lot of things. The 19th, 19th and the 20th century were the worst, you know, um, you know there's, there's a lot of real things were happening during that time. And I guess they, as a result of all of that, um, things started changing um, not too long ago, I'd say early 1970s, when for the very first time, um, the indigenous title to land was was recognized um, through, through the Calder case. And then um, I guess in, in, in the Constitution Act of 1982, the rights of indigenous people was were for the first time recognized. So it's 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 not too long ago since the real changes started happening. The challenge there is it's it's such a slow process. Um, you know, as an example, um, uh, the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example, was 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 completed. They completed their findings in 2015. And one of their findings was to establish a national holiday, a federal holiday um, for, uh, for, for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. 2015 is when that was called for, and was it not this year when um, we finally got that uh, stat holiday? And why did it take six years to actually create a holiday? Why such a slow process? You know, it's frustrating. And that that red taping, that bureaucracy is what's frustrating at, at all the levels that we can visualize um, when it comes to practice, when it comes to um, with the works that are happening in indigenous communities. I mean, that's just one little example. I'm not saying that, they, they, that uh, there was no reason for that. I'm sure our, our politicians will have all sorts of reasons for it. Uh, but hey, it's it's just a holiday, you know, um, to recognize something that's very meaningful, that's very powerful and impactful. Why didn't we just do it in the same year? Um, so things like that, I think uh, the message that I'm trying to give to you guys here is it's the process is super slow. Uh, it needs to speed up. And I think we all have uh, this, this positive obligation to speed that process up in our own capacity. So um, let's let's try um, to do what we can, um, and I guess to me, that's the reason why I'm involved in this space, and that's why indigenization is so bloody important uh, from where I stand. Um, I guess how can can indigenization be achieved? Um, since I I myself am a settler and just learning this whole. Uh, idea just learning from indigenous people as I work with them. Um, I rely on uh, on on the knowledge that already exists, whether it's um, whether it's oral knowledge, whether it's visual, whether it's uh, written knowledge. And um, what I'm presenting to you right now is a is a is a quote uh, from University of Regina's um, Indigenous Advisory Council. There's some very powerful words, um, um, and and they put those words in a 
in a, in a study that was called 100 Ways to Indigenize and, and, and Decolonize Academic Programs. So there's a link there um, at the bottom um, when you click Indigenous Advisory Circle, University of Regina, um, and it'll take you to that study, uh, which is led by Dr. Shonin uh, Peet. Um, a pretty simple and easy read um, with 100 ways, you know, um, you, you don't have to memorize any of them, uh, but I guess just read them, understand them, um, take pick one that you that 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 that's most attractive to you, and perhaps champion that in your um, in your own way, and encourage others to I guess do that as well. Um, and I guess there's other resources out there that you could use um, to to understand how potentially you can indigenize your own courses. But um, what did I got out of that um, that that list? Um, how, what was my take? This is what you've seen on the screen is essentially um, how, how I kind of try to summarize it for myself. And again, um, I'm not claiming that I know it all. I'm not claiming that I am implementing all hundred ways or uh, maybe th thousands of other ways of doing it. Um, but this is just my, uh, my take. Um, and it all kind of starts with that basic uh, awareness. The, the, the slide um, on the history, you know, just start there, um, understand what's happening today, where it's all headed in the future. And um, I guess ask ourselves, uh, what, what is it that we can do about it in, in, in our own lives? Are we, are we actually creating space for people uh, safe space for people to 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 share their knowledge. You know, um, those are questions that I ask um, each time, and um, is nothing wrong in asking those questions. Um, and then and just getting getting the right answers, I guess, is is the tricky part. Um, then I guess there's this, there's a strong need to dedicate resources across sectors, not just um, not just academic institutions, although I think academic institutions play a super critical role because this is where we are um, we are teaching people, we are we are creating the next generation um, of leaders and, and people who are going to go and rule the world. You know, um, so why not just start there? That's where I think a lot of things do change, um, and I think it's a it's a neat opportunity for academic institutions to create partnerships, uh, create sustainable partnerships with communities that are that they are either situated and located in um, or go outside and, and find other communities and build um, build relationships with those communities create exchange programs why do we need to go to Africa all the time you know I mean there's Africa right here to 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 help and work with um, so let's let's try to understand that aspect and um, and, and contribute to this, this whole process you know um, so that's certainly a need as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then similarly, there's a huge, huge gap in terms of the resources that are available. Try, um, try finding a textbook um, that explains indigenous examples, you know, and I'm not uh, trying to say that oh, they, they should be a textbook just dedicated towards um, this kind of work. But I mean, there's such good stories out there in DC, in Canada about um, about successful indigenous businesses and, and, and organizations. Why do we not share those examples in our courses? Because they just don't exist. You know? there, there is no book um, as far as I've seen. I mean, if you know of a book, please do tell me. Um, and I'd like to include that book um, in, in, into my courses. Similarly, um, I guess case studies, that's a bit of a shortage. I mean, you can, you can check out Harvard, you can check out Ivy try searching for indigenous um, accounting cases. You can't find it easily. Um, I, in my search, I found some resources that, um, that are linked to this slide, um, like Cape Breton University. They've got a good collection of cases. Um, University of Saskatchewan's got some cases and uh, indigenous governance too. Like there, there are some organizations that are making an effort, um, but I think that that has to be that has to be highlighted, that that gap has to be highlighted and worked towards. There's a strong need of writing good cases and uh, talking about uh, situations in indigenous communities. I think that certainly helps um, in, in this overall uh, process. And then the last piece that I've kind of come to realize is just adding indigenous voices in a, in, in a classroom, and, and not just classroom, I guess, our, our boardrooms, our office rooms, and 
um, everywhere that we possibly could, because it certainly then helps with the process of reconciliation. Plus, um, it gives us a different kind of a perspective, you know, um, and, and we are able to work collaboratively um, and move forward um, and, and perhaps highlight some, again, key stories, you know, highlight some good stories of um, indigenous communities that are doing some amazing things because they have the, that power to change the way um, the business world really works, you know. Um, and, and, and I think that's important when you look at uh, what's happening around us with, with uh, things like climate change, you know. Um, if the business as usual continues to, to, to be pursued um, or the conventional ways of accounting, um, then I think we are going to be in a bit of a bit of a trouble um, fairly shortly, you know. Um, but indigenous communities, on the other hand, they've got that experience of, of, of living for sustainably for thousands upon thousands of years. I mean, fourteen thousand years is the oldest community in BC. Hill said um, they must be doing something right, you know. Um, so why not? learn from that wisdom, why not learn from, from their knowledge and apply their, 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 their principles around sustainability into our own courses and change, challenge the status quo. You know, it's very much needed from, um, again, from where I stand at least, and that's what I've been trying to, trying to do in, in my course. So I guess with that, let's, I guess, talk about um, what I've been trying to, trying to achieve in my um, in my own course, um, and I'll, I'll get into way more details in a bit here, but these are just some, some of the general things uh, that, that I have done to indigenize my courses. Uh, one thing that has certainly been very helpful for me is my connection uh, with, with indigenous people, with, with communities that I work when I'm not teaching, and teaching is not a full-time thing that I do, so um, that certainly helps build good perspectives and uh, bring those perspectives back in the classroom. So that's my way of doing it. And um, if you've got an opportunity like that, I encourage you to, to continue to practice that. Um, then I guess the benefit that I have is uh, the Indigenous Business Leadership Program at SFU. It's, it's, it's Indigenous focused. So all my students are uh, usually Indigenous people, uh, leaders, uh, managers from communities and uh, community owned organizations, but also uh, the, the, the program staff and, 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 the, and the managers and the directors are also Indigenous people. So that certainly helps me get better and deliver the course in a, in a better way, having that support system. Um, but then when I'm designing my course, I guess, um, I put extra thought into, into the, 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 the choice of my titles, the, the, the way I embed knowledge, indigenous knowledge into, into, into my outlines. Um, and what I like to do is just share everything that I can, you know, uh, share as much and as widely as possible. Uh, is the, knowledge is not mine to keep. It's, 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 it should be accessible um, and for, for anyone who, who, who wants it. And I guess that's the purpose why we are here today as well. But I've also been, uh, I'd say, grateful and lucky to have uh, a teaching assistant uh, for the last two times at least, um, who have had Indigenous experience, who are Indigenous themselves, and, and they've had experience in leadership capacity in their own communities or other communities and organizations out there. So that is something that certainly helps. Then having elders uh, come in to, 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 to open the class, open the course, um, be there on call because things do go sideways. There's always all sorts of distractions um, that can create extra stress. And having an elder on board you know, um, it certainly helps with that process and alleviate some of those stresses. I mean, then I guess I've also tried uh, more recently, I've, I've invited guest speakers from, um, from, from different walks of life within the indigenous space to come in and, um, and then share their experiences and allow students to kind of relate uh, to their experiences. So that has certainly um, been very, very helpful for me. Um, and then I've, used for the last few times, I've used a case study that I myself wrote. And, um, and, and, and this, this case study was about a community that I still am very much involved with. So um, I've been using that case study, that community 
people from that community to kind of teach certain topics within the realm of accounting, you know, and it, that certainly helps people visualize uh, because they are now able to see uh, things in their own uh, in their own community and, and kind of relate to that. But I guess that's all easy for me because well, I'm teaching a course which has indigenous students, um, and in your circumstances, your situations might be might be different. I um, mean, I guess that's what we want to uh, we want to talk about and come up with some some solutions today. Um, and lastly, I guess. One thing that I've learned um, is, is, is showing compassion, um, particularly this year and, and even in the last board that I taught early on in the pandemic times, is to show compassion because um, life happens and uh, there are people with um, all sorts of difficulties, challenges, and on top of that, all these natural disasters and uh, pandemics of, of, of the world are happening. So accommodating people um, and, and, and being compassionate, I think that just, it, it just goes a long way. So those are general things, um, but I guess let's get into uh, a bit of specifics here. Um, and what I'm gonna do next is just at the highest level, I'll walk you through my course, my entire accounting course uh, that I just recently completed, give you some examples um, of, of, of how I did that course and, um, uh, we'll then just have a conversation, um, ask questions. So that, I guess, the uh, course that I just taught, it's, it was called Financial and Managerial uh, Accounting for Indigenous Leaders. It's also been called Accounting for Decision Making. So whatever the program faculty wants to be called, I'm okay with that. Um, but I guess the way I structured it is it's divided into three categories. Uh, the first one is the financial governance piece, which is really it, it, it kind of answers this idea of why, why is accounting even needed, you know? Um, and once we established that piece, um, it kind of helps me for the other uh, parts, which are financial accounting, you all know what, what, what that means, I mean, taking all the transactions and converting them into financial statements. Um, and then the last piece is the managerial accounting, um, which again, you kind of already know what, what, what that means, the day-to-day decision-making, uh, strategic planning, and all, all of that. Um, and the way we do this course is essentially, it's a five-week uh, period that I get um, to kind of teach it. And um, my students, none of them are accountants, nor are they, um, are they trying to become one. Um, so that's not a prerequisite of any any sort, they might have some knowledge about it, but they certainly are in decision-making capacities. Um, so that could be chief and councils of, uh, of communities, that could be board of directors, managers, program staff, um, entrepreneurs, you know. Um, so a diversity of people uh, exists in terms of the students that I have. The objectives, I guess, um, like I said, there's five, modules five that are covered over a period of five weeks. So it's certainly an intensive course where um, I'm trying to communicate a lot of knowledge um, in, in, in a very short compressed amount of time. So it's always uh, challenging to convince people to, um, to be on board when, when you share that, hey, we wanna try and do all this um, in, in a very short period of five weeks. Um, but just so you know, it took me five years to become an accountant. So um, that's, a, that's a bridge that you have to, um, I guess, uh, cross as a, as a teacher. But in the very first module, I kind of, like I said, talk about the financial governance aspect, but then slowly move towards um, in, in the second and the third module, we try to cover the core components around, um, around financial, uh, financial accounting. And then in the last two modules, we just get into um, just the idea of managerial uh, managerial accounting. Um, and we, when we are doing all these uh, different modules, again, the goal for me is not, or hasn't been to kind of talk about, um, diff get into the details of every single tool out there because it's just not possible. Um, the goal is always to get people to understand uh, some high level concepts and, 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 and be able to have a conversation about those concepts with people in their own organizations who are more involved in the accounting aspect because they are the decision makers. So I have to really um, manage that expectation with the students as well because there are always students who are 
more interested in the technical details, um, particularly if they're entrepreneurs, you know, they want to know how uh, things get done. So with that, my strategy is always to kind of set time outside the class to say, hey, do you want to work on this problem? And let's, let's just set a time outside because I can't teach that whole thing in a, in a class. So that's always a conversation. I'm always um, open and flexible to those kind of suggestions. But in terms of um, expectations for, for this course, it was all virtual. It has been moved to virtual. Um, and um, I kind of expect the students to at least spend 10 hours uh, during a week um, where we do all sorts of activities, but it also includes a, a three hour live session this time around, it was uh, done on, on, on Wednesdays through Zoom, uh, but the remaining time is then again, readings, assignments, and we'll talk a lot, lot about that. So I guess since it's virtual, gotta make sure um, everyone's got the right technology. And um, guess what, like it's not in, in, in the indigenous space and in, in rural communities, particularly remote places, that's a challenge, you know? Um, no internet connectivity, floods wiping off roads, uh, fires burning down houses. So that's a real thing that happens that we see in our, our, our newspapers, but it's, it's really happening um, and impacts people in real time. So just making sure that um, there is that compassion element um, that exists in working with students and being really flexible to, to make accommodations as we go. Um, and then working together as a group. And I think that's something that I really highly emphasize uh, throughout my course because in my experience what I've learned is this idea of oneness um, exists in indigenous space in my own culture it does too so um, and I guess that's that's the good link that I have um, with, with indigenous peoples um, but looking at everything as one and, and, and supporting each other um, as, as we move forward, you know, that's something that I've learned um, and, and I apply that all the time. It's, it's difficult because uh, it, it's appreciated by some people, but it's not uh, appreciated by others. But that's where uh, the professors and the teachers have to get gray hair. You know, that's where the challenge is. And you have to play the key role um, of a facilitator. To, to navigate through that and, and take the class forward um, together. So that's something that um, I've, I've been learning as much as I could. And then obviously just um, being open to any, any sort of engagement outside the live session. So that's something that um, uh, just I, I, I really highly encourage um, emails, um, discussion topics, because it's all virtual. So, you only spend three hours in a class setting and that too, like you don't know what people are doing when, um, when, 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 I'm, when I'm talking, you know? Uh, so how do you uh, make sure that the process is as engaging as it can? So um, I guess that's essentially the, the structure, the expectations, but in terms of the material that I've used, um, it's multiple resources. The first two that you're seeing on, um, on, on the left is it's a, I've used a case study that I wrote, like I said earlier, um, you're welcome to, to use it however you see fit. But then when teaching the core accounting concepts, I still use the same case study to talk about the core accounting concepts and try to apply that to an indigenous setting. So that certainly helps. Um, the book that I've used, uh, Survey of Accounting, I think it's a great book. Um, and it really breaks down all the problems to, 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 to all the way down. But um, again, people do not fully appreciate the amount of information that exists because it's not applicable to their situation. So that's a challenge that I have every time I teach the course. And the way I navigate that one is just by saying, hey, the book is there for reference. If you're interested in uh, learning a concept at a deeper level, that's when you want to look at the book. I mean, you're welcome to read it and come to the class as prepared as you can. But um, don't worry about trying to memorize and understand everything in a, in a, in a short period of five weeks. It's not going to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a fallback mechanism. So again, alleviating that, that stress um, as best as we could. And then um, additional material. So over time, I've curated material, like short videos, a um, little, little bit of documentaries, um, invited guest speakers to come in, uh, speeches and talks relevant to that topic. And um, using community literature, you know, um, not, not just material from, um, from, from professional um, organizations or whatnot, that's handy too, but 
using actual material from, from communities um, has been helpful in, uh, to give examples of uh, success stories. And, and that's, again, another way of bringing that whole idea of indigenous knowledge into, into, into a classroom, you know, because there is no books being written um, specifically on, on how accounting is done in indigenous communities. I mean, accounting is accounting, you know, that's a statement that I've heard many times. How do you change that aspect? But I think it's just the thinking that has to change when, when making decisions pertaining to finances. And that's the, that's the moral of the story that I try to, um, to, to share through, through my course. So that's the material that I use. Uh, but then in terms of um, the learning and assessment piece, the assignments, uh, the big word, the thing that irritates a lot of people, a lot of students, especially if they're executives, um, you know, people have limited amount of time uh, in a day and families and COVID and wildfires and floods. So how do you manage this part? Um, but you've got to do it, you know, because we live in this 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 weird um, I mean, there's policies, you know, uh, in in academic institutions. So you've got to respect that, which is understandable. But I guess as a teacher, I've tried to be as flexible as I could in terms of um, the assignments, and I break it down into two individual, just fifty five percent of the uh, of the grade and group, which is forty five percent of the grade within individual. Um, got three things, um, a readiness quiz, really a short 10 question uh, pop-up quiz um, that they do to kind of prepare for the next session. That's, that's essentially what it is. And people generally do really good in, on that quiz. And class participation, so how active you are in, in, in the live discussions, how are you building, um, building, building consensus, are you building upon the discussions that are happening? Um, so having a TA, um, certainly helps, um, but really creating that environment is the trick um, in, in, in a classroom setting. Then I've recently uh, discovered this new type of assignment, um, ACQ Reflections. Um, it's, it's where um, students are to reflect on what happened during the class. Did they have an aha moment? So that's A. Did they have a comment about something that, uh, that was being talked about? So that's a C. Or if they have a question, so they would normally go into the discussion board and post uh, their aha moment, their comment or their question. Um, and then the computer would assign them three, uh, three peers who would then respond to their A, C and Q in their own way. And um, that way you're basically creating a different way of uh, learning on, a, uh, on an online basis, on a virtual basis. So it, it's, it's an assignment that I uh, introduced this time around. Um, it worked in many, occasions, but um, I think three was a bit too much. So next time around, I'm going to reduce the peer reviews to a bit, um, maybe two. I think that's, that's appropriate. So um, that was my learning there. But then in terms of group assignments, that's 45%. The main thing there is the, is, the, is the final group project, which is essentially just a series of questions um, where, where I ask students to answer those questions. Um, in a way that it ends up being a, a formal report um, of an analysis that they do on an organization and not just financial analysis, but um, a, a more comprehensive analysis, um, you know, so really getting into the details of that, um, that, that, that organization that they select to kind of analyze. Uh, but the way I need to do that is I've broken down that assignment and created weekly assignments into um, saying, Focus on, so th these are the questions that you want to answer for this week. These are the questions that you want to answer for module two, module three, module four, module five. And by the time you get to module five, you basically answered all the questions. The only thing that you have to do is compile your entire report, package it up and submit it. And that way you've got the final group project taken care of. So um, it certainly helps break down these bigger assignments into smaller chunks. And um, uh, that strategy has worked with me for the last three times and I've enjoyed that. Um, and then the last piece um, that I do is just uh, peer evaluation. So how are teams doing um, internally within, within, within themselves? Um, so that really is something um, that, that works. On a, on, and, and I do it on a strength-based approach, um, not to try and bring people down, but actually help them lift each other and support each other as best as we could. So that has been the, the way I've been doing the assignments. And you try to compress it all, I guess. Um, this is what the structure really looks like or looked like for my most recent course, um, where on Mondays, 
we had this readiness quiz on Wednesdays, we were having live session in which we were having class discussions. And um, then once the discussions were done, people were uh, posting their reflections and then the peer, uh, their peers were reviewing their, their, their posts, their reflections by Friday. Um, and then on Saturday, we had BT group assignments. So that became a bit of a pattern and people got used to it. Um, it took a couple of times to get used to it, but then um, I guess that was a limitation on the way uh, the course was structured. I guess the learning for me there is um, just have a bit of an early start, you know, and then and explain these things early on um, so that things are just on the right footing on day one. Um, but even then there's going to be a problem, I'm sure. So, um, and that's okay. So, um, just adapt, I guess. Um, but the other piece is the group project, which was always due towards the end of the um, end of the term, um, and then two strength-based peer evaluations that I just discussed. So I guess that's been the whole structure of the course. And throughout this course, I mean, um, the teachers, the other teachers in the program um, at the institute, and um, the program staff, I think they've been they've been a tremendous help, and they've kind of helped me navigate through the challenges that we've had. Um, and, and and understand uh, this whole process a little bit better myself too. So I appreciate that. Uh, now, um, I guess just looking, I've got uh, this one slide per module that I wanted to really quickly uh, talk about. And I'm not gonna talk about the entire module that, that we, we went through. We just really wanna highlight some, some quick examples, um, some, some good learnings that I had. Um, here, like this was the first module that I did. Um, the objective there was to um, evaluate, like I said earlier, whether financial governance is, is relevant, is even important to set that uh, foundation, you know. Um, we had an elder come in, um, open the class, open the, open the course, but for this particular session, I had invited a guest and um, the guest was no other than um, Chief Patrick Michelle from Kanakabar, uh, the case study that we ended up using, you know. Um, he's, he's a driving force behind many things in his community. And I felt that, hey, like there could be, there couldn't be anyone better to actually explain why financial governance is important. Um, and that really helped, uh, you know, he came in and he, he talked about uh, what governance meant to him from a community perspective, the need for it, um, the key principles and, and, and people started relating it to their own scenarios, you know, uh, people start talk, looking at uh, the concepts around corporate governance, because that's what we typically teach in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical accounting course, but this wasn't a typical accounting course. So really creating knowledge around community governance felt super important um, from, from where I stood. So he came in and gave a really good introduction to, to financial governance and helped me establish this link between governance, between strategic planning and, um, and in financial management. So um, that was super helpful. Um, students really, uh, really loved it. Um, and, and I still, to this day, get messages from, uh, from students and uh, they, they can't forget that first session. So that was, I guess, one way of, um, indigenizing of course you know bringing an indigenous people person to come in and share real life uh, examples in a very meaningful way in an open way and um, ask students to ask questions you know because that can helps build this this knowledge society this knowledge base and it's all being recorded so anyone can um, view it later on as well so uh, that was my approach of doing it um, for 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 the very first module but then we went into this other module where now we wanted to get into a bit of more uh, technicalities and um, just how the accounting cycle really works, how financial information flows from, from being, being an event transaction to all the way to financial statement. How does that all work out? Um, again, had an elder to set the, set the ground straight and um, started off with a bit of a debrief of, of the previous session. And just because it was a second session, I felt it was necessary to give people an opportunity to ask their questions and um, alleviate some of the stresses that they were having, um, creating that engagement piece. So um, we ended up doing that early on, but then 
we start talking about um, well, the role of accounting, um, the different users that are involved in this whole process of accounting, objectives and principles of accounting. So the whole nine yard, everything that you can think of as accounting faculty, you probably know all of this, uh, but the idea was to create that relationship between assets, liabilities, and, and then capital or equity, you know, um, but not just talking about it from a uh, from a bookish perspective. Uh, it's already there, uh, but really using examples um, of the same community, you know, building up on that knowledge and, and sharing examples that were that were more specific. Um, so we ended up doing a bit of a, a transaction analysis, for example, and and. It was just like five or seven transactions that we wanted to analyze and um, to un help people understand how things are, are are being impacted from an asset liability and all that perspective. But um, the transactions itself were real life examples, you know, uh, from 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 a community setting, uh, from a community economic development uh, organization setting, from a uh, from a nonprofit housing setting. So that really helped people in the class. Uh, relate to uh, all of that and it, it, it certainly did, it did the magic and people were able to understand okay well how, this is how what happens when uh, when this this takes place you know when this is the impact on assets this is the impact on liability so it was impactful overall uh, by by bringing in that uh, real life knowledge into into the classroom then we went into module three um, which is about interpreting financial statements um, and I guess, I mean, this is the, the objective is pretty straight, like how do you analyze financial um, health? How do you analyze health of an organization? And to help me communicate the message here, I, um, again, I had guest speakers come in and this time I invited uh, the indigenous banking group uh, from Bank of Montreal to, to come in and talk about how they look at organizations, what do they look at when they're assessing help of an organization? Because then it was able, it, it provided a different perspective to uh, the students um, who are decision makers and often use these banking institutions to, uh, to, to, to borrow money or, you know, or make certain types of investments. So that was my strategy again on uh, explaining this particular topic. But again, what it did was, um, Real life experiences, you know, um, and, and the, all, all these uh, kind of guest speaker sessions were always for 30 to 45 minutes, but it never completed during that time. It always extended, it always went beyond that time. Um, and, and people were fine with that because they were getting some real life um, experience, real life knowledge. Um, it wasn't just me coming in and talking about um, the research that already exists in the books or, uh, or, or material that people can't re really relate to. And believe me, I've tried that in the past. Like I've used case studies uh, from, from, from Harvard or from Ivy and um, it, it really hasn't worked the way these type of engagements work. Um, and I, I can say that for my own setting, it might be different for, for you guys, uh, but it certainly isn't for me. Uh, but after, I guess, the guest speakers took off for this particular session, we did a bit of a quick analysis, you know, the horizontal, the vertical, and the ratio analysis really quickly sharing the screen and whatnot. But again, for that discussion, I didn't rely on a financial statement or an example from out of a book. I just used Kanaka Bar's financial statements and kind of analyzed it and started helping people uh, understand the story behind the numbers, you know, it's not just, oh, this is a percentage increase or percentage decrease this and that, but what's the reason behind those increases? Um, and then how can you monitor the trends that are happening in this one community, for example? So again, by sharing that example, people were able to relate to it and um, they, they, they appreciated the way it was kind of done. Then we went into um, managerial accounting and uh, this has been um, a lot of people are actually more passionate about managerial accounting because um, financial can get boring after a certain amount of time. So um, in, in this particular session, we're talking about how do you make informed uh, decisions. But one thing that was unique about this, this particular week was um, this is time when the floods happened in DC um, like two weeks ago and um, almost a month ago in fact now. So anyway, the point is, um, 
it was a stressful situation. It was, um, uh, the emotions were really high in the class because we had people in emergencies in communities in emergency situations. Um, and, and I had to adapt uh, to all of that. Um, and I myself was being impacted because of the communities that I work with were impacted and, and I knew people who were. So um, certainly uh, it was a stressful time, but then this is exactly where the elder helped us kind of uh, set the tone of the class, uh, right? And just say, hey, um, we know that all of this is happening, but let's work together to move forward um, together. And in this week, this is the same approach um, I had. I didn't have any guest speakers, so I conducted this session myself. Uh, but you know, you're seeing this example. You, you're seeing this little flowchart on on the on the left hand side of your screen. It's 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 a management control. You know, um, I didn't just teach that. I actually used that and applied to Kanakabar's case um, and showed them. Okay, well, this is how uh, things are done at Kanaka Bar and um, people were again able to kind of relate it to their own scenario um, and, and that helped me hammer out uh, the concepts that we wanted to uh, teach and then uh, we ended I remember this session by uh, doing a bit of a problem solving in little groups and um, the problems was about um, incremental analysis. The examples again not from a book but I created those examples uh, using my own experience and understanding and just real life examples. And people were able to kind of um, think how to make little decisions, you know, make or buy special orders, um, continue, not con continue or not, you know, those sorts of uh, incremental decisions. People were able to, to make, uh, understand that uh, when, when the examples were relatable. And then the last module, which is kind of my favorite and something that I do practice very regularly was about budgeting, planning, and, um, uh, and controlling. Uh, we started everything, every session was the same way with Elder coming in. But um, initially, I think uh, I, if I recall it correctly, I kind of connected the dots between strategic planning, uh, business planning, um, and annual planning you know, by sharing again an example from uh, from the community where I talked, hey, strategic plan um, at Kanaka is the land use plan, the business plan, the three to five year is something that they call community resilience plan. And then the annual plans and budgets, they have a different term for that. They do biannual planning and once a year budgeting. So people were again able to relate all of that. But the idea was to just, um, again, tell people a story, um, share the importance of annual planning cycle because that's what this session was about. I mean, one thing that was really important for me during this session was to try and connect the dot between strategic thinking, um, planning, and, and, and this concept called asset management that you've all heard of, you know? Um, it was very relevant at that time because, um, because of everything that was happening around us, um, all these impacts related to climate change. Um, so I invited uh, a couple of colleagues of mine from, uh, from Urban Systems, a consulting practice to talk about asset management and, and I guess why it's important, what it really means. Um, when do you do asset management planning and um, who does it? How do you even do it? How much does it cost to get it done? You know? Um, and again, people were, that session was very well attended and people enjoyed that practical real life experience. Um, and then we concluded the session by just getting into the budgeting process. You know, like how do you create budgets? How do you prioritize? Um, and then what are the steps once you, you've completed, uh, completed the budget? So I guess that was the, um, that was the end of, um, of, of, of my course. And um, the key thing throughout throughout every, second, every, every single module was to try and relate the theoretical knowledge to something that was happening on the ground, something that was um, practical. It was extra work for me because I had to find all that information and, and, and make it realistic. And um, well, it was already realistic, but presented in a way that was simplified and easy for people to understand. Uh, so yes, there is that extra effort, but uh, it certainly makes an impact and, and, and people remember it. So uh, I take that as a, as a positive thing. And that kind of brought an end to, uh, to, to my course uh, this year. But there's, like I said earlier, there's so many things that could still be done. And this is just, I guess, uh, a bit of a reflection of what I think uh, could be done. Again, the basics, you know, UNDRIP, um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, understanding 
uh, what's happening at our institution levels. You know, um, we've got indigenization strategy at SFU. You guys have an indigenization strategy at Douglas. Every institution is, is, is talking about it. I guess the key is to get involved in it. Um, and I'm not saying that we should to just execute all of it or memorize every single bit of um, truth and reconciliation. There's so many calls to action. Like, yeah, you just, it's, it's a lot to understand and not everything is applicable to you per, per, as an individual, to us as a society, yes. Uh, but at least we can select the ones that are applicable to us, you know, um, and, and start applying that in our uh, personal and professional lives and uh, continue to talk about them with, 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 with our families and our friends and I guess uh, people that we work with because I think that's the way to that's the way to really create that change um, understand the context behind those those um, behind those um, those those pieces of information you know um, the history because it certainly impacts today and will shape the future as well um, then I guess getting to know communities around you, um, people, indigenous people around you and getting, um, getting them to come into your classrooms to, to share their stories about the topics that you're teaching. I think that's, there's nothing more impactful than those stories because they're real, they're right there happening on the ground. Um, and, and, and it certainly has this whole benefit of um, helping non-indigenous folks like myself understand why is it so important to hear to those voices? You know, um, I'd say partner with them. You know, create relationships, mutual recognition agreements um, with, with indigenous communities to send your students to their communities and then get them a bit of a learning experience. I remember doing that for SFU uh, with Tanaka a while back. And every year, the SFU used to send their MBA students um, over to, to Tanaka and other communities to understand what development, uh, what business really means to, to them, you know? So there's that way of, uh, of, of doing it. And then I guess if you're seeing something that's, that's wrong in the system, um, call it for what it is, you know, stand up, uh, stand up against it um, and, and accept that there are other forms of knowing. It's not just the Western way of knowing things, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways out there um, an indigenous way of knowing is, is another one that, that we need, we all need to understand and appreciate and uh, move forward with, with this idea called two-eyed seeing or two-legged approach, you know, both are equally important. Let's take them and um, run with it because I think today's world kind of needs it more so than anyone, any, any other time because of all the crisis um, that, that we are uh, seeing today, um, just the recent examples are the wildfires, floods, like I said, more cold and avalanches and rain events coming in, it's not slowing down. So uh, let's, I guess, let's let's go back and learn from people who've, who've sustainably lived on these lands uh, to implementing principles like doing it right, you know, taking what we need and um, just know more. Um, if you're taking anything into the land, um, just take it out, bring it back to its original state, clean up after yourself, because we tend to make mess, everyone does. Um, we need to clean it up after we are done, you know. Um, these are just some small uh, sayings that, that I've come across over time, um, but very powerful, um, powerful learnings, and I'm sharing them with you in the hopes that we can all kind of um, you know, do our part and, and, and just be part of this change that's happening around us. Um, I guess with that, I'd like to just um, close this, um, this, this, this conversation by sharing this quote um, that I found again um, in, in my own research. Um, a very meaningful and thoughtful, um, and it's really applicable to all of us as educators. We, we do share knowledge with each other and our students, and so we, um, we hold tremendous power, you know, and um, like Spider-Man, uh, man's uncle Ben says, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. So you know, let's just um, use it to the to the for the best of the society for uh, to create something that's that's just that is holistic and that is uh, fair and equitable. Um, and that's I guess that's what I've been trying to do. So to that I guess we'll open it up for questions um, and if you and we'll hopefully answer as many as we can right now. But if you guys still have questions, do not hesitate to reach me out and. Um, these are my contact details right there. 
Thank you, Zane. That was amazing. <laughs> I learned so much and uh, have lots of questions. So, so we'll open it to um, everyone in uh, this session to ask questions. Please go ahead.